Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today we're gonna we have Hannah Otto with us here. We're gonna talk about how to become a pro like Hannah and like Ivy has done for years too as a pro athlete. We're, we got an, a question from a young athlete, and I know that a lot of us aren't young athletes, but heck, let's admit it. We all kind of dream of being a pro and what it would be like. <laughs> so it's never we'll too late. Get into that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> kind of it is, but you know. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about motivation since. Um, I think it's great to have Hannah here. Racing for your job is kind of different. And, and Ivy, you've done this too for years, but racing for your job is a bit different. But at the same time, there are a lot of similarities between all of us. What we can do when motivation drops. So we'll cover that. We'll even cover how to accelerate quickly um, and lots of other stuff. Uh, but before we do that, if you're watching this right now on YouTube, give it a thumbs up and share this video with your friends. That does a huge, huge amount to help us and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get over 100,000 subscribers. We're very close your subscription may just push us over the top. So thank you very much. Uh, please do that. And if you're listening to this podcast on whatever app, please rate the podcast. Helps us a ton. Let's get into Brian's question. Brian says, after her impressive fourth place finish in a strong women's field, Whiskey 50, Hannah Otto posted that they strategically started the race with lower tire pressure, anticipating the increase in pressure with rising temperatures on the day. It was 90 degrees at the end of the race. And the changes in altitude. As a recent transplant to Flagstaff, Arizona from the East Coast, I'm new to racing with the amount of elevation change we see out here with long events. For example, I raced the recent Whiskey 50 with ranges from 5,200 to 7,000 feet of elevation. And I realize events like Leadville and Breck Epic cover an even wider elevation range. And that's true. Those events, Hannah, I think like, I'm thinking Leadville goes, I think its lowest point is maybe around 9,500, but then the highest point is what, like 13,000? Is that right? Yeah, it's over... 3,000 feet difference, I think. Yeah, yeah, and Breck is around the same. So yeah, mm -hmm. big difference there. Um, and uh, Brian says, uh, how do you determine and accommodate for the amount of tire pressure change you're likely to encounter with in a race like this? In this case, talking about 30 degrees Fahrenheit, temperature, temperature changes, 2,000 feet of elevation change. Thanks again for the great training product and podcast, you're the best in the industry. So mm -hmm. Hannah, I guess like, I have some specifics in terms of tire or temperature. Uh, I, while you do this, I'm going to make sure that I have some specifics dialed in for elevation, but practically speaking, how did you go about deciding to do this and what are your tips? Yeah. I mean, this is something that I've done for a couple of years now, knowing that if temperature rises and elevation rises, it only stands to reason that your tire pressure will rise as well. Um, and so I think the biggest thing I do though, when I do this is I, you really have to take the course into consideration. This isn't necessarily something that you just do point blank if you encounter temperature changes and elevation changes. Um, so for an example of that is something you want to be careful with. For example, with Leadville is yes, a hundred percent, your tire pressure is going to change across the course of the race. But power line, the descent comes pretty early. And that's probably the number one place that people do experience flats at Leadville. And so if you start with an incredibly mm -hmm. low tire pressure, knowing that at the top of Columbine, it's going to be much higher, you might be risking a flat on power line. And so that's something I think to keep in mind as Jonathan does go through these specifics is you can't just take the numbers as as exactly what you're going to do. You have to consider course changes as well, because at the end of the day, what we want to do is not flat and have the best traction possible. And sometimes there has to be a balance in order to find that. Yeah. And so pressure and how it changes with temperature is pretty linear and it's easy to, or I say that I'm probably wrong here, but, uh, when you're talking about elevation, it changes in a much more or in a nonlinear way, because as you go up, it's not like every thousand feet is the same in terms of the change in barometric pressure. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but just for like a point of reference, if you're dropping from something like, uh, you know, if you're just going a thousand feet in elevation, you can expect PSI to not change much at all. Like it's hard to tell the difference between the two of them. If you're doing something like going from like zero, like sea level all the way up to like 10,000 or 15,000 feet, something like you're going to go climb, um, Mount Akea in Hawaii, something like that. In that case, then yes, you would see the tire pressure change 
and it would change only on the matter of like two to three PSI if you're running a ton of PSI in your tire. So it's really, that one isn't as imp important in terms of the elevation. However, temperature does make a pretty, like a, a decent difference. So the general guideline you'll hear for car tires is every 10 degrees and change is going to be two PSI, which is huge. If that was right for cycling and for mountain bikes, that would be like really impactful because like Ivy, if you're running like 18 PSI and you go up to 20 PSI on a mountain bike, it's really noticeable. Whereas if you're on a road bike and you're running 80 PSI, 80 to 82, you can't really tell, right? I'm just, I'm just thinking about road racers right now that just kind of like, like, I don't know, 90, you know, <laughs> just like it. super high. It's hard. <laughs> are probably like giggling at us for talking about <laughs> one to two PSI, but it's true. And in cyclocross, yeah. we have like, we all use digital meters and you get down to like, like what tire pressure you run? Like, 21 and a half. You're like, whoa, like we, yeah. it's really like <laughs> at lower tire pressures. It really is like two half a PSI, but different. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. It's huge. But Hannah, you were talking about, uh, taking the course into consideration when, when, you know, deciding what tire pressure to start out at and when thinking of elevation changes and whiskey 50, did it still, does it start with a road climb, like a really long road climb and then spit you out onto some kind of sharp single track right away. Is that correct? It does, but the hardest stuff comes at the end. So there is single oh, track okay. that you have to take into consideration at the start of whiskey, which is why I couldn't start as low as I maybe ultimately would if I was just basing it on tire pressure at the finish, but I could still start it a little bit lower than I normally would knowing that it would raise and then I would be at a better tire pressure than otherwise at the finish. Another big place that I encountered this was when I did the whole enchilada FKT, starting at 4,000 feet, going to 11,000 feet, going back down to 4,000 feet, and the temperature swung from 35 degrees to 80 degrees. Um, so that was a massive one to try and figure out, especially I did a road climb, fire road and road climb, and then a burly descent. Um, so that took a lot of different practicing and figuring out and, you know, ultimately on the day, you can't get too hung up on it because it's not like you're up there with your tire gauge in the middle of the effort checking what it is. <laughs> um, but I think just having this knowledge that it's going to change and practicing it, that's a huge thing is this is something you can train and practice and you should. Um, that's going to give you power. Even just like Ivy was saying, half a PSI in mountain biking can make a huge difference. So maybe you don't nail it exactly. Maybe you're still a little too high in the, at the end of the race. It's still better than what you would have been otherwise. Um, so just taking this mm -hmm. into consideration at all, you're ahead of the curve. And when you look at the general guideline for cyclists and what we should look at, instead of the 10 PS or 10 degrees, two PSI, it's 10 degrees, 2%. And when you look at it from that perspective, it's still going to like, you're still going to notice a difference. For example, if you start it and I'm sorry, we're doing this all in Fahrenheit. Um, but, uh, you know, you can run conversions. I trust. Uh, so if we're going to do the difference between 40 degrees start and then something like a 90 degree day. So that's like something that you might come across up in the high desert or high mountains uh, that we have here. That's going to change you. If you start at 18 PSI, it's going to bump you all the way up. If it goes from 40 to 90 degrees, you're going to expect to be sitting somewhere around 19.3 PSI. So that's something that you will absolutely notice almost a pound and a half difference. Uh, granted that's, uh, that's, I mean, we're talking a huge difference here. So we're talking 50 degrees, but that's not uncommon for the sort of races that happen in the mountain West, at least here in the United States. And it's not uncommon for that. Here's something to keep in mind though. A lot of the time, if we're just looking at a weather app, it's going to tell us what the ambient temperature is. However, the temperature with radiant heat from the ground on a tarmac road or anything else like that it's much more hot. And we've probably seen this you've on your head units on a really hot day, even though it said it was 90 degrees outside your head unit, will say that it's over a hundred degrees. And the reason for that is all that radiant heat coming up from the road. You're really close to it. You might be surrounded by cars or anything else. So it's for mountain bikers. You'll notice that because we're talking a pound and a half. However, that does change a bit. Um, when you look at like road cycling, 
these days, I don't, people probably shouldn't be running more than 80 PSI in their tires. If you have modern wheels, uh, I run like 60 PSI in my road tires and that's where it should be. That's the 28 mil tires. And I don't know what the internal width is probably 23 to 25, something like that. Um, but anyways, on that, if I start at 70 PSI, those ones are likely to, in that scenario, increase up to five PSI. But that five PSI won't be as noticeable because it's a smaller percentage of the whole in terms of what we're looking at um, overall. So anyways, I could have messed up on the math and everything here too. I just ran this through on a Google sheet really fast. But uh, for mountain biking in particular, where traction really matters and rim protection really matters and you wanna make sure that your tire's staying on the bead, everything else, that is important. It goes the other way too though. Because if you start out and it's, you know, a warm day and then you go through a cloud burst and it's like, you know, you're high in the mountains at Leadville and on a 90 degree day, you go through like a cloud burst where it's thunderstorms, you can drop down to 40 degrees, high thirties, like really quickly. And in that situation, your tire pressure also drops quite rapidly. Um, so it's definitely, this is why I think running inserts is so important because it gives you a little bit of insurance, but then it also makes sure that your tire is going to stay on the bead. If you get into a situation where it's like the tire pressure drops a ton and you're riding in really slick conditions. And then if you, you know, pull the tire off the bead and have a catastrophic crash, that'd be really bad. Um, so that's why I feel like tire inserts can be really helpful for this. This is also a reason why you want to check your tire pressure right before the race and you don't want to check it at the hotel and then drive with your bike on the back of the car or have your bike sitting at the venue because if you checked it in the morning, sat under the tent resting for a couple hours and then line up with your bike, your tire, you might as well not check the tire pressure. It has likely very much changed. So tire pressure should be something that you or your mechanic is checking right before you go to the start line to make sure it's exactly where you want it. Um, and if you're kind of a nerd and want to do this, but not a total <laughs> nerd and willing to do the calculation, to be honest, I would just start one PSI lower than you normally would if you know you're going to encounter this. Like that's just a pretty safe, if you're not going to do the calculation, that's a pretty safe bet. Agreed. And if you start lower, just make sure that you're familiar with the context of riding that tire on that rim at that pressure. Because one thing that you could do is you can go into a turn and, you know, maybe it's a bermed turn. You've got a lot of G-forces pulling on that tire and all it takes is just one PSI lower than what you typically run and suddenly the tire becomes unstable. So it's like Hannah said, it's really good to practice this. And I know somebody is screaming at like their phone or whatever else <laughs> that they're using right now, like... This is why you have the cork tire whiz um, to be able to like put those things on. And then it reads your tire pressure on your head unit. And I guess if you had something like an FKT attempt, like Hannah did, that is going to have extreme pressure variations and changes. Although in this case, if it's getting hotter, it's even more favorable for you because of how chunky and nasty and rocky that the end of that route is. But Maybe in that case, you'd want to have it. And then you can just have this plan of like, if I need to lower pressure, I can just get off and quickly tap, tap, tap and drop some pressure out and keep going. Maybe it would save you time in that regard. But really for me, it's probably less about time saved here. Um, maybe at Kona, uh, it's always hot there, so it probably doesn't change, but it's, it's less about time saved and more about control and safety. I feel mm -hmm. like, uh, for me to make sure that my tires aren't going to be causing me to damage my rim or rolling off the bead or causing me to lose traction because they're way too firm. That's my main concern. Well, and also when you really get used to your tires, the pressure is more, the PSI number is more of feedback for how you're feeling. And so even if it's saying a certain PSI, if I'm feeling good at it, I don't really, that number is just arbitrary. And that's kind of what, when I'm pre-riding and doing things, what I'm really doing is looking at how my tires are performing on that dirt. And then when I feel like, oh, this is dialed, this is, this is perfect. That's when I'm checking simply so I can replicate it. Not because that number is anything specific or magical. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, all right, we're going to get into another one. This one actually I just got through, uh, we saw through Instagram uh, today, but you can submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. I miss way too many of them that get sent through Instagram. So send them to trainerroad.com slash podcast. <laughs> but I did see this one. And Hannah, I'm going to paraphrase a bit here, but it was an athlete um, that was referencing the recent doping, um, uh, the doping offense by Colin Chartier in the triathlon world. And it was asking, 
next time we have Hannah on, can you ask Hannah what it's like going through the whereabouts program and what's required to do that? Um, what it's like when people show up at your door to drug test you and then also how often you get uh, tested. So can you share what it's like in terms of like, what is the whereabouts program and how do you actually follow through and, and comply with the whereabouts program? What's involved in that? Absolutely. So First, I want to say is there are different categories within the whereabouts program, and I'm aware of all the different categories, but I don't know the intimate details of the categories that I'm not in. So if I misspeak ever so slightly on one of those, please forgive me. Um, But yeah, so there's once you reach a certain level in sport, whether it's ranking or a certain achievement you will get a notification from your governing body. So for us, it's USADA. Um, and you, congratulations, you are now on the whereabouts program. And so what that means is <laughs> you register Congrats. with the, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how I choose to look at it because it's funny. Some people, it's it's kind of upsetting too, and I completely understand that. Is It, it is upsetting that we have to have this because people cheat, and cheating is such a bummer. Um, on the other hand, I choose to look at it as, wow, I'm doing so well that people actually care what I'm putting into Mm -hmm. my body. Um, and it is also protection for us, right? As athletes, because doping is harmful. It can even kill you in many instances. And so this is a way that I think we also protect our sport and our bodies, um, from that harm. And so, you get this notification, you're now in the whereabouts, you have to put in all your information, you go through an online training, and then depending on what category you're in, there's whereabouts. And so what that means is I have to put in my primary overnight location, so the address in which I'll be spending the night most of the time. Um, If that changes for any sort of extended period of time beyond a weekend, I have to let them know. And I have to put in all my competitions and where I'm staying at those competitions. And then USADA reserves the right to come test me at any time. And when they come, if we interact in any way, so if I'm home, if they see me, I've been pulling out of my driveway in the car, that's, I have to pause. Um, Once we're in contact with each other, your chaperone, your agent can never leave your side. And so you are now together and you will be together until you're able to give the sample. And the sample, it can be blood. It can also, it, for me, it usually is um, peeing in a cup. Uh, and it's a very extensive process in which you go through it all. It's a lot of checking, double checking. You tell them every single thing you've had uh, supplement wise in the last week. So that's not just questionable supplements that could be as simple as a multivitamin. It could be as simple as a protein recovery drink. You need to list out everything you've had within the last week. They'll put it all down. You give two samples, an A sample, a B sample. They send it off to the lab. And then usually within like four to six weeks, you'll get another email that hopefully says, we did not detect anything in your sample. Thank you for being a part of clean sport. Um, and that's that you can also have it at competition where you'll cross the finish line. The very first person who will meet you at the finish line is a chaperone. They'll say you've been selected for anti-doping. And then again, that person cannot leave your side until you give the sample. So they'll go with you to the team tent. They'll go with you to your car. They'll go with you wherever you go. They are next to you. Um, you have to produce identification. So as a professional athlete, you always need to have some form of ID at the race. Um, Just all of those little things that you want to consider and think about. There are more extensive whereabouts categories in which you also have to give an hour every single day in which you're guaranteed to be at that location. Um, And then if they visit within that hour, you better be there or it's a missed test. And that is a massive issue. Um, So that would be the more rigorous side of it as well. So do you set that one for like three to 4 (laughs) a.m.? I think think it's like (laughs) 6 to 10 p.m. is the range that you're allowed to pick an hour within. 
It seems like I see them showing up at 6 a.m. or like really early a lot of, a lot of the times, it seems. so. <laughs> yeah, um, I've had... Hannah, I've how, had- how is... It's got to be tough to um, keep track of everything you're putting in your body. Like, I, I think that if we stop and think about this as amateurs that don't do this, it would be hard for me to go back and tell you every little thing I ate. And then you go to like a restaurant... Um, or you have a drink of your friends, like your friends, like, Hey, try this. Like, and you just try something at like a rest. Like I, we put a lot of things in our body subconsciously. Like we don't even actively think about what we're putting in. Is that hard? And do you do anything to be able to track all of that? Yes. To, to all of it. So on one hand, I think as a professional athlete, my life just day to day has changed a lot in that I don't put anything in my body that I'm not a hundred percent sure about because it is your responsibility. And so I check and double check. There's, um, Globodro, which is a great website in which you can see whether something's banned, not banned. Um, and that's something that I have on my phone that I can check all the time, everything from, you know, an Advil to a prescription that your doctor says you need, you have to check it regardless of whether your doctor says you need it or not. Um, and so I check every single thing I put in my body. I don't take, you know, I think one of the things people don't think a lot are topical stuff. So I'm not just going to take a lotion from my friend if I don't know what it is. Um, because it doesn't mean that it's something bad. It could be totally great for the average person. That doesn't mean that it's okay for a professional athlete. And so it's my responsibility to not use those things. And then when I do use something that I do know is okay and a fine substance to be using, I take a picture of it. And I just pretty much every week, I'll take a picture of everything and then I'll delete it at the end of the week if I don't end up getting tested. But that way I just have a, something to look back on and know here's everything. You know, if I take an Advil, I'll just take a picture of it so I can look back and say, oh, okay, yeah, I took this on Monday um, or whatever it might be. I have a lot of allergies. So Benadryl, for example, is something that I might have on there that I just take a picture so I can remember. Is, is this, when you mentioned that if you like leave for a weekend, you have to make sure that that's updated. So you can't like, you can't just live like, you know, free and easy and like, <laughs> just like, no, oh, I'm going to go like over here. I mean, you can do that, but you just have to make sure that you're updating them or updating your whereabouts with every single time when you're changing your location, especially if you're in that higher tier, that's got to be exhausting. Yeah. I think they make it as as easy as they possibly can for you. It's really simple to go in and change it, but it's still, I mean, I think that people don't realize how frequently your plans do change, whether it's, oh, my flight got delayed and now I'm stuck in Denver for an extra night or something like that. I mean, those are things that athletes, especially in that most rigorous tier, they need to be extremely aware of. It's something that should always be um, on your mind. Yeah. I'd, Sophia is the sort of person that never an I is never, or is never left, not dotted. A T is never left, not crossed. She's very like, has everything down. There've been multiple times when like, we've been going somewhere and Sophia like looks over to Keegan. Did you update your whereabouts? Like, did you update? Like, <laughs> I, you know, I've, it's like a normal part of their life. Uh, and it's never, I don't have to report my location to somebody like, you know, it's the really, only, I, it's like the only time when that whole, that meme where like, you know, the it's either it's Venn diagram overlapping or like the, the big strong arms reaching hand in hand. It's like, you know, criminals on house arrest and athletes just living their lives. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. having to constantly report where you're at. That's, that's it's just really, really funny tough. Like I'm you, grateful you all do it, but it's yeah. tough. It's really funny when you go on like vacation or on a trip with people and you're all kind of in a group. And so no one's sharing an address. It's just like, oh yeah. And then we'll all go from the airport to the hotel or to the Airbnb. And you're like, but what is the address? But what is the address? But what is, because you had to put it in. And so you can never, you're right. You can never just be free as a bird going with the flow. You have to make sure that you have that address, the physical location. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, another aspect of this too that I feel like is probably really 
tricky is thinking about all the like supplements in particular just have to be something that's really scary. Like, and I wouldn't blame an athlete for just avoiding them. Do you avoid, like you mentioned that you always pay attention to what you take in, but are there certain things that you avoid like taking in, whether it's certain types of like restaurants or anything else? Yeah, I think supplements are, are really scary and I've pretty much stopped taking any sort of supplement at all. Um, so when something says supplement facts on the back of it versus something like nutrition facts, it means that it's not fully regulated. And so as an athlete, the scariest thing is maybe that supplement is completely fine, but it's made in a facility that makes something that is banned and all of it's going on the conveyor belt, and there's just this small amount of cross-contamination, you are responsible for that. And so mm -hmm. it really isn't worth the risk. And that's, I feel like, how I've started living my life is, is taking this supplement worth the risk of a cross-contamination? And without a shadow of a doubt, the answer is always no. So I take yeah. no supplements. Um, and if there is something that I feel like I really need, for example, a doctor says, hey, you need to take this in order to be a healthy individual, I will seek out a brand that is certified through the clean sport program. So there are clean sport programs such as Informed Choice that go into those factories, et cetera, and certify that, hey, there is nothing made in this factory that's banned. So cross-contamination is completely impossible. And that was something that actually First Endurance, I'm sponsored by First Endurance this year. And that was something that was super important to me when I spoke with them is what are your practices that ensure that this is safe? And they sent me back a super long email detailing exactly how they ensure the safety, the different programs that they work with. And for me, that was massive. That made me trust them so much. And that I think is one of the reasons that partnership became so beautiful for me was I just value so much when brands are transparent about, um, about the fact that they are clean and they go through those steps because it's not cheap for companies to ensure the cleanliness of their supplements and their products. It costs them a lot of money. And so when brands do go that extra mile to do it, it's because they really care. Yeah. This is, um, I don't want to plant any sort of fears here, but I, I also feel like there's a big risk to taking in aid station nutrition too. Mm. Like, I don't want to get like, I don't want to plant any sort of conspiracy theories here, but I mean, <laughs> let's just say like, okay, how easy also, would it be to, sorry. <laughs> also <laughs> just for ahead. your stomach. Also like, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I mean, like hot dogs, what kind you know, of whatever. sugar <laughs> mix is in this like mystery Gatorade jug? Like yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> just the thing. Like, I don't, I don't. I don't view volunteers as being like, you know, intentionally nefarious or something like that. But <laughs> when you're talking about like the top levels of sport, think of how much money is on the line and think of how easy it would be, man, this is a movie plot y'all. I'm sorry. I'm going to plant this fear, <laughs> but like how easy I can go to Ironman and I can volunteer at an aid station. They aren't going to screen me. They aren't going to check anything. I can easily carry a banned substance in my pocket, a capsule of something. I can put that in there and then I can make sure when a certain athlete is coming through, I can try my best to make sure that athlete takes that. Like there's just, and, and that would be not the fault of the athletes in the respect of them actively doing something, but absolutely the fault of the athletes in taking something where they don't know the exact origin. I, as the volunteer could swear that it's Coke could swear that it's Red Bull could swear that it's water, whatever else, but it doesn't matter. Like in the end, you don't know. It's just, there's a lot of responsibility. It's kind of, yeah, it causes anxiety not, for me. You're not being paranoid. <laughs> I had a teammate once that was not a U.S. writer, and we did a like, coffee shop stop, and I left my bottle on the cafe table and went inside and came back out, and she, like, grabbed me by the shoulders and was like, don't you ever leave your bottles like out there in the open, unsupervised again. And I was like, 
oh my God, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> you're not, you're not, uh, you're not totally off base, John. You yeah. hope people aren't that nefarious, but I guess yeah. it's possible. <laughs> well, I think to the average population, for us, I think doping, it really, because we're in a situation in which we either know someone who has or one of our heroes has been caught, like this whole situation in triathlon, it's devastating. But the average population mm-hmm. isn't close enough to feel that devastation. And so when I, when I was in college, actually, I took a pharmacology class for my major, and we had a section on um, performance-enhancing drugs. And they asked the class, like, do we think these should be legal? And I would say over half the class said yes. And their argument was, mm. we want to see spectacular performance. We don't care how it comes. And that is devastating to me. And yeah. that, that's, it's, a, it's absolutely devastating. And I just think that there needs to be a lot more education around what that means, not only for the health of the athletes, but also it becomes a competition of science, not of actual physiology and performance. There's just, I, it's really, it's devastating. That's the only word I can really use for it. Yeah. It's definitely, it's a totally different um, part of sport that absolutely colors every aspect of how you do the sport as a professional athlete. And us amateur athletes just don't have to deal with that. And look, like we all need to abide by the same rules. I'm not saying that we don't need to. However, practically speaking, we aren't going to be held responsible for those rules in most circumstances. That's just the, the actual truth of it. Like, unless somebody has reason to think that somebody is doping and they report that person the only other time that they're probably going to get tested is if they win a very very big event Um, but even then like a lot of amateurs are not tested uh, because of that and i know that we aren't racing for money or anything else um and for me like if somebody beats me and they're doping i'm not paid for it i don't care it's like that sucks but i'm not gonna you know it doesn't it's not like it's my livelihood and somebody's stealing from me as a result of that, you know, but it is, we still need to abide by the same stuff and it's just a complicated layer. So I appreciate you sharing all the information. Nobody ever talks about whereabouts, that program and how it works. That was really helpful. So thanks. Hannah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because appreciate you get it. thrust into it and you're like, wow, this is brand new. Why has no one ever explained this before? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's definitely a very yeah. fascinating process. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Okay, Brendan has a question, and I want to go to you first on this one, Ivy, and then um, Hannah, get your thoughts too on it. Um, Brendan says, I'm fitter than I ever have been, and after three races of going way faster even than I thought I could, I'm now in a big slump of not wanting to train or even go for a walk. I hear this is common, so I'd appreciate it if you if you wanted to go into a shallow dive on the post-race blues or post-race depression. Um, love the podcast, five stars on all platforms. Thanks from Brendan. Um, Ivy, uh, we've spoken about this before. Um, you've experienced it. How do you manage it? Yeah. We call it the stage race hangover. I think Mm -hmm. I've maybe used that term before, Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not a stage race. Um, man, I just think it's worth considering the not only emotional toll of a buildup to a race and everything that goes into preparation and execution for it. Um, but also the physical toll And I think it just leaves athletes more drained than we maybe consider. You know, we think about that, that race and that effort on the bike, um, and don't consider the full scope of how taxing it really is to prepare for it, uh, mentally and physically. And, you know, we just have a threshold for that kind of stuff. And I think athletes more commonly than we think get fatigued in those aspects. And then this big buildup is over and, we've struck all of our matches and we're left kind of drained and tired and don't know where to place or what to attribute that fatigue to. And all of a sudden this goal that you had is over and maybe you don't have something else to look forward to. And so you just kind of spiral. Um, it's, it's totally normal. Um, I'm sure Hannah has experienced this a lot, especially doing like really big races. I've, I've like, uh, had athletes do, or 
had buddies that do like world cups or, you know, like super high level races and get like sick every time afterwards, just, um, Mm. for no reason other than like that huge buildup and they're just like so drained afterwards. And yeah, I'm sure Hannah can relate. Yeah. I mean, I'll be totally transparent and say I experience this in all aspects of my life, not just racing. I think for me, I love anticipation. I get so excited for things. That's half the fun for me is just anticipating Mm -hmm. something. (laughs) So whether it's like a vacation or a party or a test, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be a race when it's done. It's like, what am I looking forward to now? And I feel like I can almost spin out. Do you out. say you get excited for tests? I mean, you build up to it though, right? Oh, and so yeah. when it's done, <laughs> yeah. it's like, what now? You know? And I think that yeah, what now feeling sure. is really scary and intimidating because you've been thinking, anticipating, getting excited, and then you finish and you're like, what am I supposed to think about all day, every day now? And so for me... Mm-hmm. One of the things that has helped me in this area of my life is having things to look forward to when I know that that big event is finishing. And that doesn't mean constantly having something big on the horizon. No, that's not practical. But when I know, hey, I'm racing the world championship or I'm racing Leadville or I'm racing this really big event or the season's coming to an end, I make sure that there's something else to look forward to, even if it's super, super simple. Like, my husband and I going on a date that we've date night that we've been putting off or, Oh, I'm going to do this hike that I didn't have time for all season. Or, you know, I'm going to have a girl's night and we're all going to get together and, you know, have a picnic or something. Even if it's super small, just having something on the books to let my brain jump to is super, super helpful. Um, the other thing I would yeah. say is make sure that you're not overtraining in preparation for the event. This can become so much harder and the downfall bigger if you did overtrain because you ha- not only are you experiencing those emotions, but your body doesn't have the energy to deal with those emotions. And so making sure that you are rested accordingly throughout all of your training is critical And the last thing I would point out on this is you said that you're stronger than you've ever been. That's incredible. Congratulations. What that also might mean is that you finished the event and you accomplished your goal. And not only are you thinking, well, now what am I excited for? You're thinking, now what can I achieve? Because you've already Mm -hmm. checked off that huge accomplishment. And that can be hard for athletes when they win the big thing, the big title. It's like, well, I've accomplished everything I ever dreamed of. What is left? And I think it's really important to take a moment to pause and create another goal. Um, Even if you're not going to reach for it for a while, I think just having that goal in the back of your mind on a piece of paper is huge because that is ultimately what's going to make you excited to get back out and train again. Yeah, I, I get, so I get this absolutely. Uh, but it, like you said, Hannah, it's not just related to racing anecdotally N equals one. When I have any sort of really, really high emotional experience of one regard or another in a positive way, it makes it so that afterward dropping back down to normal, the Delta between the two feels so profound that I feel depressed from it. Mm-hmm. Um, And there's nothing quite like the feeling, you know, mentioning here, Brendan, fitter than you've ever been. You had these races where you performed really well. You're, you reached a new high in terms of just like uh, an emotional experience, most likely from this. And as a result now, normal, suddenly, whereas it used to be normal, there's such a delta between what you know you can experience in terms of satisfaction And that high that you get from this competition and performing so well that now normal doesn't feel as exciting. This is why I think like for me, I'm very much wired that way. And I chase really hard that high feeling over and over again. And it's very similar to like what you see and what drives a lot of people towards substance abuses too, or substance abuse situations in the sense where like now you've achieved, you've felt something that suddenly makes normal feel not okay. Um, so this is something that 
you'll notice a lot of athletes work quite hard on making sure they're never too high, never too low, but trying to keep things around the middle ground. You'll notice that with a lot of different athletes, um, across different sports. And I think that what a lot of them are trying to chase is this sustainability to make normal feel okay. And to be okay dwelling there. Uh, I, this is hard because at times you can feel like you're trying to hold yourself back from being excited and fully appreciating the moment. So you have to ride that balance. But at the same time, if, um, otherwise, if you get yourself into a situation where you're always letting yourself go as high as you possibly can and as low as you possibly can, it gets exhausting. Um, and life gets really exhausting in general as a result of it. So there's, I looked for a lot of research on this and, and most of them of course are like observational retrospective style studies that you'll find. However, there's a lot of stuff that you can look at to just get anecdotes and examples and maybe get some comfort in that and see what's going on. There's a good review. Uh, it's, and it has a lot of resources to a lot of articles that are cited within this. It's called Abandon to manage the post Olympic blues Olympians reflect on their experiences and the need for a change. And this was written by Brad Shaw and his colleagues in 2022. Um, so I would recommend going and checking that out. I'm going to link that down below that has a lot of different links to studies, mostly observational where they look at this. Um, in most cases, there's a differentiation between like a uh, clinical long-term depression that's being diagnosed and then what these athletes are experiencing. However, symptomatically speaking, it's, it's very simple or very similar. Forgive me. Um, it's, it's so d don't feel as if, um, feeling this and going through what you're going through is somehow inappropriate. It's absolutely appropriate. And it's common for people to feel uh, across the board. For me, the biggest thing that's helped is having an event. Um, or something else to look forward to. I don't, um, I always try to have something down the road later on, no matter what. So, and it isn't like if I don't have one, I panic. Sometimes I need to have a break and that's okay. Um, but in most cases, that's really helpful for me is to have something down the road. Yeah. Also, I advise Brennan to just like, let yourself be bummed out for a second. You know, yeah. if it, if it needs to be like a whole week after this chunk of three races where you just let yourself focus on other stuff and don't beat yourself up for not wanting to go out and train. Like it's okay. And maybe your body is trying to tell you something that it's time. Like, like we said, this is of course psychological, but there might be a phys physiological effect too, where you, um, those aren't, those can't be separated in an instance when you're overtrained and fatigued and you might just need to chill out for like, mm -hmm. take your rest week. Um, and that's okay. And you can still use that time to make your next goal and decide to have something to look forward to and still also need to take some time off and take a rest week and let yourself recover. I also think this is a really good time to press into community. A lot of our pursuits in sport are individual and in some ways are very selfish and a lot of people give up a lot in order to back us, whether it's, you know, someone taking care of the kids for you when you're training or, you know, you not being at work because you go to the race or whatever it might be. And then you come back and if you're still looking inward, it can feel empty because you've accomplished your thing or you've done your thing. And so it's a really nice time to then look outward and actually look back on the people who have helped you. And maybe even though it's hard, even though you're tired, say like, hey, how can I help you? How can I press into your life? Um, and I've personally found that when I'm able to change from that me, 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 which you often experience going into a big event and change it to someone else and say, hey, let me be your support. I actually gain a very similar sense of satisfaction from helping that person. Well said, uh, and Ivy a really good point about like, let yourself pass through the period and uh, without guilt, because sometimes that period of experiencing the low allows us to, to appreciate and to want normal again. Whereas otherwise, if we had not passed through it, we would not want normal. Right. Um, yeah. so there's a lot to that. Rob's question actually dovetails into this quite well. It's a very different circumstance, but it's also about motivation. 
Um, Rob says, hi team, I'm trying to get back and motivated after quite a few months of no riding due to a couple injuries and life just getting in the way. I'm not sure if this is a unique feeling, but I'm struggling to get motivated to make myself hurt again. I'm not sure if it is because of a lack of a goal or race to look forward to. Maybe it's mental or physical. I'm just a little bit stuck in a rut. I've done a couple of easy endurance rides, but the thought of anything harder is daunting. I'm feeling quite unfit and my FTP is decreased using AI FTP detection by around 10%. Um, any tips or suggestions that you have for me? Thanks for all you do. Love your work from Rob. Um, Hannah, what, your job is to like, I guess you could phrase it in one way. Your job is to hurt. Like that's <laughs> like, so how do you, how do you manage this? Is it purely the professional motivation or do you have to also find motivation to go through and to suffer? Yeah. I mean that learning how to suffer and suffering, even when you don't want to, I think are massive parts of a professional cyclist job. And some days it's easier than others. And it's funny because it's funny how I think it's helpful just for people to hear. There are days where I go out and it's like, I can suffer really well today. And that's almost hard to put into terms because it's not even necessarily <laughs> better numbers. It's just, oh, I can really dig in. Um, and so I do think it's an art and it's something that will ebb and flow and it is going to come and go with life and other responsibilities and especially energy. I am a huge believer that energy is a limited resource. And if you're in a place in life right now where things are taking a huge amount of your energy, you just don't have enough to dig that deep. And that's okay, especially if you're not a professional cyclist. If you're a pro, for me, when that happens, that is, that's a moment where I have to check myself and get rid of those things taking that energy because it's my job to have that energy. For you, it might just be, hey, I don't have this energy right now because I'm dealing with this at work and I'll have the energy in a month. Great. That's totally fine. I think that it's really important to acknowledge that and build up. I think when you don't have time to suffer, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. It just might look different. So I think these times are great times to do things like tempo and sweet spot. Um, they're still hard. You get great workouts from it, but it doesn't hurt as much as something like VO2. And so I think also, if you start slowly going into that, your body almost learns what it feels like to hurt and you might just become more comfortable being uncomfortable, as they say. Um, the other thing is you said that you've fallen back on your FTP. I encourage you to set brand new goals if you haven't already. I know that one of the worst things that can happen is if you're still seeking those goals that you had when your FTP is higher, at this point they feel so far away that that goal is too far away to actually be motivating. So that goal can still be a long-term goal, but set some shorter ones because you're going to be so surprised how quickly you move back towards that FTP. And so you're just going to be smashing all these small goals that you set on your journey back to that FTP. And that's going to be re really motivating and feel really good. And I know that it's a lot easier for me to suffer when I'm just like, okay, one more watt, one more watt in the interval rather than well, I'm already 15 watts lower than my target, so I'm not going to hit it anyways. Like, let's be honest, one is a lot more motivating than the other. So press into that motivation for sure. Those long-term goals too are tricky for me because if it's so far away that I feel like I have a ton of time to build up, it will make me... I won't be as, here, as adherent to the plan if I know that I have you know, months and months and months to build towards this, this goal, you know? And then when I'm not feeling motivated or feeling bummed out, it's easier to be like, eh, I'll, I'll do a like recovery ride today or easy spin instead of this workout because I have six whole months to get ready for this thing, you know? <laughs> and so like, like you said, Hannah, those short term goals are really important. And, um, you know, even if it's just 
your goal can be not even a race or like a power target. You could make a goal for your week and be like, okay, my goal is just to get out for 45 minutes, just three days this week, whatever that looks like, you know, like going to the pump track or uh, riding to work or just doing an endurance ride and not having any structure goals. You know, you can have a goal like that. Um, and then I know for, for someone like Rob, when I feel this way, um, and I feel like I'm not fit and I'm scared to start doing structure training again and really unmotivated, this is when I do group rides. And if I'm feeling not fit and I'm used to riding in the A group, I'll drop down to the B group. And that can do a lot for my motivation to feel like I'm with my community and they might push me to go a little bit harder than I would otherwise. And then I remember for Rob, who isn't motivated to really hurt and suffer right now, um, they might push me to suffer more than I would otherwise. And then I'll remember what that feels like, believe that I can do it, and then be motivated to go suffer on my own so that that next week effort you know, I feel more equipped for it or, you know, it just like re reinvigorates me that I, I can do it and do remember how to suffer and knows what it, know what it feels like and know how important it is. So group rides are great for stuff like that. Yeah, I good. look at this from two different directions. Like I'm, I, as a human am wired to like view pain as a stimulus or as like a sign of something that I should avoid. Right. Like we're, we have reactions where we pull away from pain and that's like how we're wired. But we also have this other part of us that's wired that when we go through challenge or pain or fear or anything else, and we come out the other side, we get a big dopamine release and a big like reward, like an inbuilt, a built in reward system is there for that. There are times when I'm not able to see through the pain to be able to see the reward. And that makes it difficult to be able to accomplish what I want to do. So for me, it comes down to, uh, I have to, if I've noticed number one, if I have a long time off of training that tempo or sweet spot feels brutally hard because I'm not conditioned to enduring that sort of pain. And I have to accept that I have to be okay with it. And yeah, sure. Like my FTP is a lot lower. It doesn't matter. It's, you know, tempo still feels hard when you're not used to doing anything, um, that that's going to be painful and uncomfortable. So you have to respect your body's process as it goes, as it gets, as it gets used to things again. And so sometimes, you know, we get the question of like, should I train before I start a training plan? And we say, you don't need to, because you don't like, you can just jump in and train. But at the same time, if you're having a difficulty, difficulty with just getting used to discomfort again, then that's absolutely a great thing to listen to in your body. And then at that point, it's like, okay, I'm going to ease my way into things and just get used to it. And like Ivy said, find environments that aren't necessarily you looking at numbers that you view as a representation of yourself compared to previous you and you getting into that unhealthy place that Hannah was talking about where you're trying to live up to past standards. If you can go into a group ride, if you can go do a climb that you really like again or a route that you really like again, and you just enjoy that route, maybe you'll find through that process, you'll be able to see once again on the far side of suffering and see that it's worth it and you get this enjoyment out of it again. But you have to find the ways that are acceptable for you and where you're at to be able to view that. And it's going to change. It's going to be different. Like, um, I get this in the middle of a week where like, like right now tonight I have long VO two intervals. And if I'm Frank, like that's daunting thinking that I'm going to be out there doing like lower VO two percentage, but I'm going to be holding them for six minutes. Uh, those are really hard intervals. Those hurt. So um, bad. so, and I have to, I know. Yeah, they're hard. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those are hard, but I know I'm, I'm close enough to prior experiences where I went through a hard workout and I saw the benefit thereafter. I felt the benefit thereafter that it's sufficient to get me through. If I didn't have those experiences, I'd probably be thinking about something different. I might be thinking, Hmm, maybe what I can do is bring in sources of motivation, like my favorite music, like my favorite snack to have in between the intervals, or maybe it's a climb that I really like that happens to be around six minutes long. And mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for that climb instead. And that's like where I sit, but I just, I have to find ways. I have to recognize where I'm at and not punish myself for it. And instead, I just have to find ways to help myself through it. Cause I know that once I get there, it'll be okay. And I'll recognize the fact that it was worth it, but it just takes some time. I think a big thing in 
what Jonathan just said is he never said it's going to be easy. In fact, he acknowledged the fact that it was going to be really, really hard. And that's actually really important. They've found in studies that mentally preparing for something equally to how challenging it will be helps you achieve it. If you go into something denying or thinking it will be easier than it is, you're more likely to fall short because when your brain thinks it's going to be easy and then it's hard, full-blown panic. Your body and your brain are just like, this is not (laughs) matching up. Forget it. We're shutting down. But if you've already told your brain, hey, this is going to be super, super hard and we're doing it anyways, when you come up against that challenge and it gets hard, your brain is like, oh, I guess you did tell me this. It doesn't make it easier, but you're more prepared (laughs) to encounter that challenge and you're more likely to push through it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this one, next one kind of dovetails in with this one too. It's from Pavel and Ivy. I'm going to go to you first on this one because cyclocross, this is what it's all about. It's about hard, snappy efforts, like out of turns, starts, Mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. So Pavel says, I'm a long time listener and love all the stuff you're doing. I've gained a lot of knowledge. Thanks to your podcast, mostly in diet and training. Thanks, Pavel. Pre- appreciate you and everybody else that listens to this podcast. It's amazing. We have like uh, over like, you know, a hundred thousand listens to this podcast every week. And it's just so cool. We're, this is episode 419. Kind of have to pinch myself sometimes. Can't believe you've done <laughs> all that. That's really, really cool. So thank you. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Uh, Pavel says, getting into my question during a few of my cl- uh, cycling club trainings we do on every Thursday, I noticed that I have a lot of problems with accelerating be it after stopping, getting out of a corner, or any other circumstance that needed to grab brakes or involved stopping. Is there any way to have a better acceleration on a bike? I don't have a problem to get to my club mates with a small sprint effort after I gain a bit of speed, but I really struggle with gaining that initial speed off the line. Uh, Thanks from from Pavel. What what are you thinking of, Ivy? As somebody that, um, I think you're a great example of this, like you're able to like accelerate and and be snappy and, and respond to that sort of stuff. Are you thinking of any like technique things or anything else that Pavel might be doing or missing? Yeah. And because they're describing this scenario after stopping or out of a corner when you're at, you know, assuming really slow speed and not describing like, oh, in these ride scenarios, when someone accelerates, they can't respond. And they're saying that they have no problem accelerating getting up to speed and everything, or once they're back up to speed. And uh I would bet you 20 bucks, John, this is 100% (laughs) a gearing issue. Like I feel like I can just see it in my mind, like stopping at a, at a, at a traffic light or out of like a really slow corner and just seeing them in this like super huge gear and everyone else is in an appropriate (laughs) gear (laughs) in a really like light gear and have thought about before they get to the stop sign or the corner thought about, Oh, we're going to almost stop. I'm going to get into an easy gear. And then when they go again, they can get on top of the gear quickly. And Paul is just in this like massive gear, just slow turning. Oh no, wait for me. Like I guarantee this is what, (laughs) what is happening. (laughs) So I think it's a gearing issue. It sounds like a gearing issue. You should try to anticipate when those stops are coming or when you're going into corner, like cycle cross every time going to a corner, when I see it coming, um, I'll shift, uh, before I coast into the corner or before, if you, if you do, you know, like these are all very anticipatory things, um, that I'm assuming that the people that you're riding with are doing, and that's why you feel like you can't catch up with them or you're not accelerating as good as them. Mm, You probably are just as fine of an accelerator. You're just not doing that anticipatory, like shifting to get into an easy gear for when you're ready to start riding again out of that stop or that corner. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree with Ivy. She absolutely nailed it. I think I can almost guarantee you it's a gearing issue. You need to be in a smaller gear. Just as Ivy said, you need to anticipate it just for the sake of adding something different and extra. I would say that it could also be a momentum issue. Clearly that's not the case with stopping at a stop sign or something, but in terms of cornering, I know a lot of the time, especially in a race scenario, you're sp- you're sprinting out of a corner and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, how is everyone doing a thousand watts out of every corner? 
because <laughs> that's what you're having to do. But the people at the front might actually be doing 400 watts out of every corner because they're not braking as hard. And so learning how to carry your momentum and not braking as hard could be critical because they might not actually be accelerating. They might just be carrying momentum and you are not carrying momentum. Therefore, you're slowing down. Therefore, you're having to accelerate. And that's not something you're ever going to be able to match. Your acceleration will never be the same speed as someone carrying momentum. It just doesn't equate. And so that could also be something you look at is, are you breaking more or at different times than everyone else? If you're breaking in the corner and they're breaking before the corner and carrying their speed, that will be hindering you big time. Yeah. I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that I, I'm just going to assume because everybody does start with a slower cadence. Like when you start out, unless you're, you drop down to little ring and big cog, like you are going to start out with a slower cadence. So I'm just going to assume that like, whether it's gearing or not, you're starting out with a slow cadence. And I see a lot of people struggle with stability and being able to put power through the pedals when it, either just coming from a stop or accelerating out of a turn because of having to deal with that lower cadence. The way in if you have any sort of void in like tension and connection in between your contact points, right? And like your hands, basically all the way down to your feet, then it's kind of like what you're trying to do is like, let's say you have a long stick in your hand and you're trying to like press a button on a far wall with it. It's really easy if the stick is long enough because the stick is straight and reliable. But then if you were to cut out the center section of that, and instead of it being like a solid stick, like you replace that portion with a string, it would be impossible to do it because you have this void and connection in between it. And a lot of the time we don't know how to maintain connection and tension all the way through our body. And as a result, it makes it feel like impossible to be snappy out of a turn. Um, you know, when you accelerate and when you sprint, like you'll feel your jaw tighten up, right, Ivy? Like coming out of a turn, like everything is engaged when you come out of a turn. What does it feel like when you're snapping out of a turn to, to maybe give somebody an idea of what they should be feeling like? What? Uh, sorry, I'm caught off guard. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like in terms of that tension and like momentum? Yeah. yeah, tension, momentum, engagement. Like, is it just you're pushing hard with your legs? Are you moving your bars side to side, like just flopping them side to side? Or what's actually, what are you actually feeling in your body? Like when you're accelerating out of a turn. Yeah, yep, yeah, hard um, accelerations. Oh yeah, it feels, uh, it definitely feels like there is tension on every part of the bike, but also like every part of your body. It doesn't feel like anything is being reserved or relaxed. And, uh, engaging every part of your body is a way to also conserve energy, uh, which sounds like counterintuitive, but if you like use everything and create that tension on the bike, um, you're saving, you know, it, it could be the difference between doing, having to do 600 Watts out of the corner and three or four because of the efficiency that's created when you are really creating that tension and using all of your body. And, um, that looks like maybe more bike movement than you would think. Um, and it looks like usually getting out of the saddle. Um, but yeah, it's much more than just a, like throw it in a bigger gear and stay seated and pedal hard because you're going harder and accelerating, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I it's feel a, like it's I like can a total body workout. Like, yeah, I feel like know? I can feel all of the neuromuscular connections. Like I can feel the individual muscle fibers, like the motor units, like engaging, like it's every single part of your body working together. I actually equate it a lot to, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but box jumps. It's a very similar feeling mm -hmm. to me of like my brain telling my body to do something and then feeling it almost like come together in unison for this singular explosive movement. Yeah. And it's, I remember, um, Pete Morris, uh, the uh, good friend of the podcast, um, Pete, even like we were talking about with the cliff team one time, like they were talking about how sore sometimes their jaws get after a really hard mm. crit. And they were like, yeah, like the next day, like, just from like gritting their teeth because they're trying to, they're, they were so contracted, like every single muscle within them. 
was contracted when they're, when they're having to do these hard accelerations out of so many turns. And this is something that I feel like, uh, you need to practice. So like go to a situation where you can't have a lot of resistance on the pedals, typically a climb, right? And this is something where you want to ease your way into things and start to get more comfortable with what it feels like to use all of your body to pedal that bike. That doesn't mean that you're throwing your bars necessarily side to side. It's just a lot of contraction involved in it. And it doesn't mean you're going as hard as you possibly can in order to create that tension. It requires control. And that's what you're trying to practice is that control and moderation of that tension, not just I can create this tension only when I'm going as hard as I can. Yeah. I swear one of the most helpful things for me is standing up out of the saddle and coasting with one leg down and the opposite hand being the main one on the handlebars. Like the other one's just a passenger is just sitting there. And what you'll find is that counterbalance in between your right leg and your left hand or vice versa. And when you find that relationship, you start to recognize the fact like, oh, when I do that, I'm actually like, there's a lot of tension in that leg. There's a lot of tension in that arm and it goes through my core too, to be able to just coast straight while still doing this and then flip to the other side and feel what it feels like. And then once you start to get that relationship of what that tension feels like, then you'll start to actually be contracting all of your muscles when you link it all together um, and you'll feel it happen. But what I've learned from this is that everybody needs to, the reason that I asked you Ivy to explain what it feels like is that somebody's out there listening to a thousand different people explain what it feels like, but it's not the right thing that they need to hear. Mm -hmm. Somebody just needs to hear somebody say it in a specific way, and then it'll kinetically make sense to them. And they're like, oh, my God. oh that's what I'm going for. I you hope know? I did okay. That's a hard, that's a hard it's exercise hard. for me. Words hard, not good. <laughs> I feel like, did you ever struggle with that either, Ivy? Because you look very comfortably naturally on the bike. So I don't know if you ever struggled with that or if that was just like, you, you had it. No, I did. Um, and I used that description of just like thinking you needed to throw it in a bigger gear and pedal harder because that's absolutely what I did for the first couple of years that I was racing. And I saw everyone else accelerating out of these corners. And so I was like, oh no, I need to pedal harder here. And I was just being deeply inefficient and learning to create that tension and move my bike more and let it work with me to accelerate me apart from mm -hmm. just the effort in my legs made a huge difference in conserving energy for me and just like going faster. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go into Jonas's question. Last one. Jonas says, I'm 17 years old and taking my training seriously. I want to race professionally. Am I too late in the game? I feel like I started training too late. Another question. I feel like there's a lot of riders that have started to train at age 13. And so now they are ahead of the game. And then Jonas goes on to ask, uh, do you have any tips on nutrition and how should I be eating to become a pro cyclist? Also follow me on Strava. Jonas says Jonas Canals is the name that's C-A-N-A-L-S or canals. I'm not sure. Um, but Jonas, um, good job on training and working hard and with your ambitions, uh, becoming a pro. I want to like Hannah, how do you become a pro is a really big question. But in this case, Jonas is 17 and asking if they're too late in the game. What would you say to Jonas? I feel like I almost can't even answer the question because I'm just laughing so much. And Jonas, it's completely out <laughs> of love. Um, you are so far ahead of the game. That's why I'm laughing because <laughs> the idea that you could be too late in the game at 17. Okay, laughing aside, I do understand <laughs> because as a 17 year old, you feel like I'm so deep in life that you can feel in that moment um, that, gosh, what have I been like, you know, it, it's late, but I promise you, you are not late. And you will also laugh at this question 10 years from now at 27 and you're looking back and you're thinking, I'm 27, I'm still very young gosh, 10 years ago, I was super duper young. I promise you that's how you're going to feel. And I can say it because I'm 27 and that is exactly how I feel and how I felt at 17 <laughs> also. So this is like firsthand experience. Um, but all of that aside, like those 13 year olds, that's awesome. And I don't want to take anything away from them because the sooner you start, that's so cool and so fun. That said, statistically speaking, there are actually very few athletes that start at the age of 13 that make it all the way through the ranks to become a professional athlete and make 
a living out of it, which means if statistically speaking, there aren't that many of those, that means that the pros have to come from somewhere else and they come from starting later. They come from starting at 17, at 20, at 25, at, you know, and so you just all of that to say you are not late in the game. You you have so much time and I encourage you because you are actually still so young, you still very much need to look at the long game and feeling like you're starting late could counteract itself by feeling like you have to get to a certain place in a certain time frame, And that's very much not the case. So I encourage you to take a breath and remember that you have a long ways to go and you have a long time to get there. So don't compare yourself to those 13 year olds who started early right now, that four years that they've had on you might be big when you're 30 and they're 34. Those four years are such a smaller percentage of your career. It's not going to matter. Um, so don't compare yourself to those athletes. Just compare yourself to you and make sure that you are improving over time. And eventually that improvement will equal being a professional cyclist. This is, uh, I'm trying to look up right now, um, the American development model that USA triathlon has. Cause that's the, like the first thing that came to my mind. It basically talks about like, uh, this is what you do along the way. Like this is how to set expectations. Cause I see this quite often where kids are like 10 years old and they're like, all right, should I be doing VO two on Tuesdays or should I be doing threshold on Tuesday? And like, you know, and they're like, really, they just want to go full in. Uh, and it's a unique sport because it's very transparent with its training and we get to see that sort of thing. Whereas it's something like basketball or a traditional sport, we might not see the training as much and the training is much more involved around direct play. So as a result, like, you know, it's a bit different. But I'm just going to read off like some of the things that it says to help set some expectations here. So stage one, they call it discover, learn and play. This is not about training. This is about having fun. And that's zero to 12 years old, somewhere underneath 12 years old at 10 to 16 years old. They call it the develop and challenge spot. And they say, now that you have athletes who understand the fundamentals of the sport, you can start to introduce more sports specific skill development. But don't forget to teach how total body movements and activities through, uh, and this is specifically for speed skating, but it's the same model through off ice training and multi-sport activity can be beneficial, but really off the bike training and everything else. So in other words, it's saying 10 to 16 years old, don't be so obsessed with the bike that you're getting into like hard training yet, but rather enjoy the bike. Maybe you're working on skills that are specific to make you a better bike rider, but you aren't getting to the point where you're following a strict training plan or anything else. Stage three is the train and compete stage. That's 13 to 19 years old. And in this range, which is where you are right now, it says the focus starts to narrow training sessions and programs become longer sports, specific skill development and race simulation and practice start to become critical. Multi-sport activities should be geared toward cross training, running, cycling, structured strength training programs to help set the stage for future development. Athletes should start to take ownership of their own path. So this is in 13 to 19 years old. And I think really evident with what you're trying to see right now, like taking ownership of your own path. You're asking these questions. Am I too late to start? What do I do? Everything else. So this shows that you're perfectly on course with this. After that, it says stage four, excel for high performance and participate and succeed. And that's technically anything over 15 years old. So there's overlap there, but they typically start to see where that starts to go even higher after 19 is where like there's an inflection point and where that starts to change. So you're perfectly on schedule. Um, there are a lot of athletes that start very young, but that doesn't mean that they start doing interval training very young there. They start young and they just enjoy the bike a lot. Uh, Jonas, I, I don't know if you have a, um, a Nika program or any sort of like development racing program in your region, but in most cases, what they'll have like Reno Devo, we have an incredible program here and it works with kids that are from five years old up to like 10 and it gives them fun rides. And then there's like, uh, after that they can in participate in rides that are a bit, maybe like they actually ride a trail instead of just like riding around it, like a bike park. And then it'll get to the point where there's a club team where they just meet more regularly and ride together and they do skills games on the bikes. 
And then after that, they'll have opportunities for them to race if they want, and they'll uh, give them these opportunities. Then from the club team, it goes into a regional team, and that regional team actually is going to contend races, and they'll get their first training plans and that sort of thing. And it's very loose. It's nothing too intense. Then the national team is where it's much more like structured. These kids are training. Uh, they have very specific outcomes they're trying to accomplish. Um, and those kids are typically all, you know, at the very end of high school and going into college. That's typically what you see. So you're, you're in the right spot, Jonas. Don't feel like you, um, are behind the curve at all. Ivy, uh, I don't know what thoughts you have. Uh, I just want to advise Jonas, you know, asking any tips on nutrition, how should I eat to become a pro cyclist? Uh, I think as a 17 year old, you should talk to someone like Alex Larson, who we have on the podcast, a nutritionist that works with athletes and maybe get, I mean, you're 17. I assume that you like your folks cook for you. Um, but more importantly, when you go to college or move out or whatever, um, your, uh, specifically when you go to college, if you go to college or if you're on your own feeling like you have to, you have all these choices for food now available to you. Um, I think you should really get some help from a nutritionist to have some good fundamentals and, um, start like learning practices of how to cook these like really good staple meals for someone that's trying to be a pro cyclist. Um, because I could give you like some generalized goals to reach for in terms of protein and carbs and things, but not knowing you and your, you know, body composition and what your normal diet is like, like, I think that this is a good instance, like this would be a good use of resources to have a consult with a, with a nutritionist to make sure you have a good plan going forward with like support of your family. And when, or if you, once you turn 18, if you go to college or move out or whatever, just having a good plan is really important. Yeah, this is, um, I would really think that this is a spot too, where, you'll probably hear a lot of really bad advice from people that have been in endurance sports for a long time and have dated perspectives that are really dogmatic and not focused on nourishment. So I really like that suggestion, Ivy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about commitment to the goal of becoming a professional cyclist. Cause I feel like it does require commitment. Um, Hannah, like for you, you've got your degree, um, you're, you're great on a podcast, for example, <laughs> you're a great communicator. You like, you're able to connect with a lot of people. If, if Hannah, for some reason, couldn't raise bikes tomorrow, I would not be worried about Hannah making money. Like <laughs> Hannah's got skills or being and fulfilled like, and, and being stable. fulfilled and, yeah. and like having everything that you would want to have out of a career, right? Ivy in the sense that like, you know, what you have, um, is that ever hard for you? Hannah to feel like, well, I could just like, maybe I'm not cut out for this and I could just go do something else because some people it's kind of like, um, like, you know, if I was to become a professional motocross racer back in the day, I, I, I was, you know, simple brain and that may, might've been the only bet for me. Like, <laughs> so like, you know, it's kind of like you better do well at this or that's it. Some athletes are like that, but in this, this case, you have options. Do you feel like that's ever a temptation for you or something that makes it harder to stay committed to being a pro athlete? No, I find it actually very much the opposite because it's clear to me every day that I'm choosing to do this rather than mm. I better make this work because it's the only option that I have. I think that would actually feel a lot more um, forced than the fact that, hey, I see a lot of outlets I could do with my life, but I'm choosing to pursue professional athletics because it's how I feel most fulfilled. It's what I love the most. It's what fulfills my why, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's huge. Um, I'm a huge fan of Steve Magnus, and he has – um, made some comments and reference to we shouldn't glorify the concept of going all in. And I love that because that's probably, that is definitely something that I've struggled with throughout my career is feeling like, do I need to offload everything else in my life in order to be the best I can be? Um, 
And I feel like over and over I've come down to the answer of no. I think that doing all of these other things, having all these other abilities in some roundabout way makes me the best I can be on the bike. But you still wonder, right? And what Steve Magnus Mm -hmm. has talked about is going all in actually can create a desperation that is counterproductive. And having other things on the side creates a well-roundedness and a comfort that allows us to pursue what we enjoy and what we want to be good at um, with more fervor because we're not afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes being afraid of that failure because it's the only option we have can actually either hold us back or make us so desperate that we fall victim to bad things. Um, And so I think that Everyone is different, but for me, it's been really valuable and really important in my life to constantly acknowledge actually the fact that I am picking this route. And that also helps me in the days when I'm not as motivated or things aren't going as well. I get to remember, hey, I picked this and remember why I picked it. Um, And that can help reignite that motivation sometimes. Yeah. Well said. I think there's, um, a lot of, there's athletes all over that spectrum in terms of what, like, uh, what motivates them and what they do to, to make that happen. Right. Um, so Jonas, you may be along the lines of, of Hannah. The thing that I really like about Hannah's approach is that it, it's flexible and balanced and seems like there's really clear paths forward to like health. Whereas I, I, there are a lot of examples of other athletes that were just like, this is all I can do. And And they got a lot out of themselves as a result of that. Maybe there were some hard things about that as well. So there's different, you're you're probably different on, you're in some spot between Mm -hmm. the the polarizing ends of a spectrum on that for sure. But this is, that there's like an interesting thing about becoming a pro cyclist in general. There's a lot of different ways to become a pro cyclist these days. Um, I guess you could probably compare it to like playing different positions on a field within a team, like on a soccer team or something to a certain extent. But even then there's like really wide ranging because on road you have those teams and you have those positions, but that doesn't include track cycling, cyclocross, mountain biking, and all the various forms of mountain biking that exist and gravel and, and then you, you know, possibly even multi-sport options. Like you have a lot of different options. So, and one thing that I found watching kids go through a development program and go through, I feel like the most important thing is that they love riding their bike and that they enjoy that. And then they're going to find and, and go into whatever path that they feel allows or allows them to feel the most fulfilled in their love of the bike and, and just themselves, uh, personally, like we have a lot of kids that went through the Devo program that were just like insanely strong cross country racers. And some of them race downhill now, some of them are runners, some of them do other things. And it's just like, they found whatever they needed within that. And that's what drove them. So, um, I, I absolutely love encouraging you Jonas to become a pro cyclist if that's what you want. Um, and, but the main thing is I hope that you just love your bike and you love what the bike gives you in one way or another. And then I know that if that's the case, you're going to find your way, um, going through the whole thing. So, and I would also encourage you that there's a lot of ways to, there's a lot of, like Jonathan just said, there's a lot of ways to be a professional cyclist. Um, and that could look very different than you imagine right now. I know talking to a lot of juniors when I ask them, what's your ultimate goal in cycling? A lot of the time, the goal they list is being on X team. And that's great. And it could totally happen. But you could also be a super successful professional athlete on a different team or creating your own team or having your own paying sponsors or Maybe you're one of these athletes who, who does big video projects. Um, maybe you make bike your profession, but it's not in the standard uh, athlete way. Maybe you become a professional mechanic or a team manager, or maybe you're an engineer and you make the fastest wheels we've ever seen. Um, so just because your route in cycling doesn't maybe look the way you're imagining it right now doesn't mean that you're not achieving your goal. There's so many ways that you can be a professional in the cycling industry that I think you can make it happen. It just 
depends what it looks like in the end. Yeah. Agreed. Awesome. Well, thanks Hannah for coming on Ivy. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a good episode. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you could rate it five stars on Spotify. That would hugely help it. That's where most people are searching for spot or for podcasts. So go there, rate it five stars. And if it doesn't deserve a five-star review, reach out at trainerroadcom slash podcast and tell us what we need to do to earn that five-star review. Hopefully we can do it. Hopefully it's a reasonable request. Like, you know, no, no unreasonable ones coming in, please for five stars. <laughs> uh, and if you have not yet signed up for trainer road or left a review for trainer road, if you use it, that's a huge way to help too. Uh, we appreciate you all. We'll talk to you next week. Submit your questions at trainerroadcom slash podcast and good luck, Hannah at the next races you'll be doing. Thank you.